Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, freshly returned from my misadventures in Russia where I was casting King of the Sea 8 um, and also recording my voice lines for Captain Jingles where I will be included at some point in the future as a playable captain in the game. At this point I have no further information on that other than I've done my part and now we just have to wait and see. Today's video is something that I very, very rarely do. In fact, I can't ever remember doing prior to the carrier rework. This is, in fact, an aircraft carrier replay. This is Jester 29 in Her Majesty's Ship Implacable. I thought it, uh, it might do for you lot to actually see what goes into playing a decent aircraft carrier game. And so Jester 29 is going to start off straight away by showing us some of his sneaky, dirty, filthy aircraft carrier player tricks. Now what you're going to see him doing here with his dive bombers immediately after takeoff had me baffled. I could not for the life of me figure out why he just dumped his first weapon load straight into the sea and sent those first two dive bombers straight back to the carrier. Turns out there's an entirely logical reason for doing it, as his dive bombers pass a bunch of the enemy dive bombers on the way to their respective targets. It's all to do with saving your aircraft. Hang on a minute. Why are those enemy dive bombers shadowing him? Well, they can't attack him directly, but they can drop a fighter consumable on his location, and that's basically exactly what they've both done here. So their fighters are busy shooting each other down and effectively neutralising each other. But back to that initial seemingly wasted weapon drop. You're going to see him keep doing it, at least for the first half of the battle. And the reason he's doing it is to save his aircraft. And we're also going to see, although not just yet, a good example of exactly why it makes sense, at least at the beginning of a battle, to try to keep your squadron, or as many aircraft from your squadron, intact as you possibly can. Although not just yet. First, well, this Molotov has very foolishly isolated himself from any kind of mutually overlapping anti-aircraft fire support offered by the rest of his team. But now we're going to see why it did actually make sense to save the first two aircraft from this squadron immediately after takeoff at the start of the game. The Gneiser now's anti-aircraft defences are no joke, but it's not just the Gneiser now. There's a Duke of York and a Monarch as well. If he still had four aircraft here, if he hadn't saved the first two aircraft, all four of them would have been shot down there before he could get them back to the carrier, before he could recall them. Even if he committed to the first attack, before he could successfully recall the remaining two aircraft, they would have been shot down by that overlapping anti-aircraft firepower. And that's a factor at the beginning of the battle, when the ships haven't had time to disperse, and you do still have all of those overlapping zones of anti-aircraft fire defence. And he's doing it again with his torpedo bombers for exactly the same reason. So you might be thinking, well, surely it's better to have them and not need them than to need them and not have them. But, well, if you have them, there's a very good chance you're going to lose all of them, particularly at the beginning, when you have all of these overlapping zones of anti-aircraft fire defense. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the hell is going on with the Lexington over here. He appears to want to get his um, secondary gun batteries into action. This is basically a suicide, and I have no good explanation for it. I mean, he's a top-tier aircraft carrier. I appreciate that things can be rough for Tier 8 aircraft carriers, because when you get into Tier 10 battles in a Tier 8 aircraft carrier... Yeah. However, he's not in a Tier 10 battle. This is a Tier 8 battle, so the Lexington is basically committing suicide. And that's going to make things extremely difficult for the Furious on the enemy team, because there are two carriers per side in this battle, and the Furious is a bottom tier aircraft carrier in a tier 8 game. He's only tier 6. I, I really have no idea what possible benefit the Lexington thinks he's going to get from moving this far forward. I mean, nobody needs to turn their aircraft around that quickly. Or perhaps he's just farming aircraft kills. Perhaps that's it. Perhaps he has a mission to get aircraft kills and he figures very selfishly that this is the best way to get it done. Well, anyway, he's dead. Now on his first strike on the Lexington, while he managed to land torpedoes, he also aggroed the Lexington's fighters and while trying to evade them, ran straight into a hail of anti-aircraft fire from a Fiji and an Amagi on the corner. This time around, he's managed to get some aircraft away, but they're all 
seriously damaged. And again, aside from the enemy Furious, which still has fairly strong anti-aircraft defences and its own fighters, all of the other available targets were still kind of clumped up together with those overlapping zones of anti-aircraft fire. So rather than probably get all of his aircraft shot down, because they were very low on health, he's just recalled them and straight back to the carrier. And this time he's going out with a squadron of dive bombers again. Once again, he's saving the first two aircraft from the squadron. They're already on their way back to the carrier. They will be straight back on at the flight deck, rearmed, refueled, and ready to reinforce the next squadron that he launches. And he's going out with the remaining two elements in the dive bomber squadron. Now the Gneiser now has managed to separate himself, not by much, but probably just by enough, from the defense offered to him by the Duke of York and the Monarch over there. But Jester still has to plan his approach carefully, not just to maximize the number of bombs that he's going to get on target, but also you have to take into account where the surviving aircraft are going to be after the first attack. And you really don't want to have them coming out of that attack right on top of the Monarch and the Duke of York, taking fire from all three, including the Gneiser now. I thought Jester was going to try to get some additional damage and some fires set on the Gneiser now, but he takes a bit of a risk here and it doesn't pay off. Instead, he goes for the Duke of York. Now, we only lost two aircraft there, but again, this is why he effectively saves two aircraft every time he takes off. Because if he'd done that with four aircraft remaining, he would have lost all four. Of course, he might not have lost any if he'd gone for the Gneiser now, and he almost certainly would have been able to actually get some bombs off and do some more damage, but, well, he saw the opportunity to maybe get some additional fires set on a different targets, and, well, yeah, it didn't work. But it only cost him two aircraft to find out that it wasn't going to work, rather than four. I think going for the Duke of York there, rather than Gneiser now, was his only real misplay, because if he had gone for the Gneiser now, it would have been dead by now, and he wouldn't have wasted a torpedo attack, trying to steal the kill on the Gneiser now there when it was on such low health and burning fiercely. Although perhaps he thought, well, maybe he's going to put the fire out, maybe he's going to start healing. Best to be safe rather than sorry. Now there's a very suspicious looking smokescreen over here that's harbouring an enemy Fiji, and you'll note that the combat air patrol from the Lexington is still alive and kicking, although hopefully not for long. Now he's managed to aggro the combat air patrol, and it's going to cost him a couple of aircraft, but his tail gunners are going to take them out. So now there are no aircraft outside that smokescreen to spot him for the Fiji, although the Fiji didn't actually shoot at him with his anti-aircraft guns, and that was probably a very smart move, because a carrier can actually see where you are, even if they can't see you in a smokescreen, just by following the tracer back. There's also a very suspicious looking smokescreen just over there to the left, which is almost certainly harbouring a Belfast. The Belfast, however, is firing his anti-aircraft guns. Unfortunately, Jester just doesn't really have enough health left on his surviving aircraft to do anything about it. And is almost certainly about to recall this lone surviving fighter. Because really, what can you do with one aircraft? Other than keep targets spotted. But this one's in the red now, so rather than lose it, he recalls it and gets back up into the air with another dive bomber squadron. Now at this point, actually, he's getting a little bit too close for comfort, pops to the map screen to issue movement orders to the carrier. New Orleans here is in serious trouble. The Furious is sending in dive bombers to try to finish him off, so he drops a fighter patrol over the top of the New Orleans. It's not quite going to be enough. But I think the New Orleans actually managed to get his own catapult aircraft up as well. So those dive bombers are going to have all kinds of issues. Likewise, this Scharnhorst is in serious trouble. But Jester's going to see what he can do to help out. He's going for the Duke of York. Just stopping to issue some more movement orders to the carrier mid-combat. And gets back right as he starts running into the initial bursts of flak. Going for the Duke of York first. Obviously because he's lowest on health. And... Not a lot of damage, but manages to set a fire. Now, that does look like a lot of anti-aircraft fire, but don't forget, at this point, both of those battleships have probably received enough high explosive hits to knock out a lot of their anti-aircraft guns. Duke York is gone, the fire's got him, and if the fires didn't get him, the torpedoes from the Scharnhorst probably would have, and he's got a much, much better uh, approach angle on the Monarch there. Six penetrations and another fire, still taking anti-aircraft fire on the way out, and the aircraft are taking damage, but the Monarch has just run out of friends, so it's only his anti-aircraft fire that Jester has to worry about. 
and he was burning pretty fiercely a couple of seconds ago which means he's just used his damage control so any fires set by this final attack which is successful that fire is going to keep burning back to the carrier that smoke screen by the way that's a fiji and he doesn't have a full squadron of dive bombers ready to go he only had three or four aircraft on the deck there's one on the way back so instead He's going off with the rocket attack planes, but then he starts taking fire from the Fiji in the smokescreen, who he has just spotted. So, quick change of plans, launches the torpedo bombers instead. Now, the Fiji has gone undetected in the smoke. Don't forget, that works both ways. Unless there's somebody else actually targeting the implacable. If the Furious, for example, were to send some aircraft over and spot him, the Fiji no longer has anything to shoot at and he's firing his anti-aircraft guns, which means we can see where he is in this smoke screen, even if we can't actually see him. Jester's ship is actually spotted right now. The enemy Furious has sent torpedo bombers over, and they're currently being engaged by the combat air patrol. But there's a couple of torpedo hits on the Fiji that thought he could get away with not being spotted. Well, technically he did. He isn't spotted, but the torpedo impacts also tell us where the Fiji is. I'm guessing that he's probably reversing up, because he wouldn't want to be caught by the same trick in the same spot twice. Jester has dropped the second set of torpedoes right behind him, and there's another impact. Lining up for a third attack, and then... Oh, actually, no! Ship's in trouble. Back to the carrier. Yep, there it is. Those are from the torpedo bombers from the Furious. Only one impact. Surviving torpedo bombers from the Furious over there going down to combined anti-aircraft fire, not just from Jester's Implacable, but also from the friendly Fiji over there. And by now, of course, he's managed to get most of a full squadron of dive bombers up. So he's thinking about going after the Fiji and finishing off the job, obviously. But the smoke screen's dissipated and the Fiji is no longer in sight, which means he's almost certainly limped back into cover behind the islands. Which means that even if he were to spot him and attack him, he wouldn't be getting any assistance and support from the King George V and the friendly Fiji over to the left. On the other hand as he issues fresh movement orders to the ship, the friendly Mayhan is in a lot of trouble and would probably appreciate the help considerably more. He's going to lose a gunfight with an Akatsuki. He's on such low health. Now, the other carrier on the team, the Ranger, is helping him out with the rocket attack planes. Not quite sure what the Ranger's plan is here with his rocket attack planes. I mean, he does respot the Akatsuki, but rather than going in, and he's got four surviving aircraft in that squadron, so he could make two strikes, he just drops a fighter squadron instead. But it's all good, because just the act of spotting the Akatsuki means that the Mayhan can sit inside his smoke screen nice and safe, and blast away with him with his guns. Jester gets an attack off, the Ranger comes in for the attack, but it's the Mayhan, thanks to the help from the two aircraft carriers, who actually gets the kill. Now, Right up until the point where that Akatsuki got sunk, it was three against four. As Jester's issuing fresh movement orders to the carrier here on the map screen. And you can't help but wonder to yourself just how this battle might have gone differently for the enemy team if their top tier aircraft carrier hadn't just suicided for no good reason that I could see right at the beginning of the match. Because that poor Furious over there has been putting up one hell of a fight as a bottom tier aircraft carrier and could almost certainly at this point really use the support of a top tier aircraft carrier who had nothing better to do. In fact, he's looking like a very, very juicy target at the moment, particularly for these dive bombers, because British dive bombers tend to drop in a sort of carpet bombing pattern. They just sort of plaster an area the size of a football field with bombs, and the deck of the Furious over there is more or less the same length as a football field. And that was a lot of hits. Of course, with just the one dive bomber left, he immediately recalls the remainder of the squadron. And he's back up into the air with the torpedo bombers. And this time, be very, very quiet. We're hunting Belfasts. Now, what do you think the odds are that that Belfast is going to try to smoke up? I'd say around about 100%, because he's actually sitting broadside on there to the Fiji, who just scored a rather large chunk of hits. Now, he silences out the aircraft guns but not his main guns. <laughs> and Jester could see from the tracer exactly where the Belfast was. And there's kill number five and the Kraken unleashed. And that just leaves that poor old Furious completely alone 
without the benefit of any kind of friends and has almost certainly gone to full brown alert at this point. But credit where credit's due because that guy is not giving up. He's sailing away from that mayhem as fast as he can. He's sending his rocket planes out to attack him and has almost certainly got his combat air patrol off cooldown, which is going to make things interesting for these torpedo bombers. It's only a matter of time before we respot him. There he is. Setting up for the side attack. The Furious is recovering his torpedo bombers. There's the combat air patrol. So this is going to be a costly attack. I forget he has his own anti-aircraft guns as well. But he's two tiers lower than Jester. So while he is taking damage, and he is going to continue taking damage while he opens up the distance to turn around for another attack, he gets the first two torpedoes into the target. He's used the heal on the aircraft, so they're back up to full strength. Unfortunately, they're about to catch a nasty case of fighter aggro. And that was a lot of damage. The first attack element gets shredded, the backup planes from the second attack element drop down to take over the attack, and he does get the torpedoes away. Uh, but he's probably... nope, he's lost all of those aircraft. So well done to the Furious, and he has also managed to sink the Mayhem with his rocket attack planes. And those torpedoes actually missed. But he's really only delaying the inevitable at this point. He's starting to take fire from, well, everybody left. <laughs> I mean, the Fiji, the King George V, and of course, Jester himself. He, he's been losing so many aircraft so quickly he can't even recycle full squadrons anymore. And he's now on such low health that even a single bomb hit is likely to finish him off. And there is kill number six for Jester 29 in HMS Implacable. Six kills, Kraken Unleashed, and the Confederate Award with 102,000, nearly 103,000 damage done. Jester 29 in HMS Implacable on the North American server. All that, and I never even got to use the Top Gun quote. Yeehaw, Jester's dead. Oh well, you never know. Maybe next time. So, a big thank you to Jester for spilling all of those dirty, filthy aircraft carrier secrets. Uh, I hope you all, even if you don't play aircraft carriers, or in fact especially if you don't play aircraft carriers, learn something from it. But most of all, I hope you all enjoyed it, because that's it for today. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.